Good morning. Welcome to 2023. Wow. Amazing, huh? I'm telling you, the older you get, the quicker it goes. We do want to welcome you, though, to Olivet Baptist Church Sunday morning worship, uh, the first day of the year, 2023. I'm looking forward to seeing what God has in store. It's not coincidental that all of you that are here are here and those online that are watching. So God has something for all of us this year as we walk with him. So let's begin. Rightly so, in worshiping him corporately, let the Holy Spirit lead you as uh, you share your love back to our King and our Savior. So Wes, we'll turn it over to you. Amen. Amen. Our Old Testament scripture comes from Judges, the seventh chapter. Starting at the 13th verse. Find these words in Judges, the 7th chapter, 13th verse. Gideon arrived just as a man was telling a friend his dream. I had a dream, he was saying. Around a loaf of barley bread came tumbling into the Midian camp. It struck the tent with such force that the tent overturned and collapsed. His friend responded, This can be nothing other than the sword of the Gideon son of Josh. The Israelite, God has given the Midianites and the whole camp into his hands. When Gideon heard the dream and its interpretation, he bowed down and worshipped. He returned to the camp of Israel and called out, Get up! The Lord has given the Midianite camp into your hands. Amen. 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 And our New Testament reading will come from John, the fourth chapter. That's St. John, the fourth chapter. And the 23rd verse. And the, the word writes, but the hour coming, and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And may the word of God dwell rich in your heart and soul this morning. Amen. We thank you, O gracious God, for this direction from your son, Jesus Christ. We first thank you, O Lord, that we come and enter a new year. And we pray, Lord, that we come and enter this new year with our hearts open and minds set on you. We come, Heavenly Father, knowing that you are God, and we come, Lord, recognizing your word today. We come, Lord, to be true and win our worship. We become true within our understanding and lifting up your magnificent name. We we'll pray, Lord, that we allow the Spirit to work with us today. At this present time, as we've come to enter into your presence, we come to enter you, Lord, and give you the praise and worship you that when we made it through 22, you have a plan and goal that it continues and exists for us in 23. And so we worship you, Lord, anticipating to see what you have for us, anticipating to see what is going to work out for us in 22, anticipating, Lord, to see where things will arrive that we will have to lean on you and things that will arrive that we will continue to have prayer and have a relationship with you. Thank you for the spirit that works with us. Thank you for the spirit that comes and goes as we go and the spirit will stay with us and comfort us and provide us the things that we need to continue to lift you up and to magnify you in your righteous and holy name and you will see the praise. Amen. 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 Let's continue prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, we come this morning, the first day of a new year, Heavenly Father. We are in a sanctuary, Heavenly Father. No better place to be is to be in your sanctuary and worshiping you on the first day. Heavenly Father, we want to get our hearts right, want to get our minds right, we want to get our souls right, Heavenly Father, and we come to worship you. We're going to worship you, Heavenly Father, in songs. 
We're going to worship you, Heavenly Father, in prayer. We're going to worship you, Heavenly Father, in giving. We're going to worship you, Heavenly Father, in the, in the sermon this morning. Gracious God, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity in worshiping you. Thank you, Lord, for another chance in worshiping you. Heavenly Father, we sometimes we take for granted in worshiping you. We do not want to take it for granted, Heavenly Father, for we realize that this is an opportunity, Lord, to get our hearts right, to get our minds right, to get our souls right. We thank you, Lord, for the preached word that's going to come. We thank you, Lord, for those who are sitting with us right now. We thank you, Lord, for those who are online. We want to give thee all the praise and all the glory in our worshiping you today, Heavenly Father. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ who paid it all for us. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that continues to, to, to guide and direct us. Oh, gracious God, we thank you, Lord, for this time. Thank you, Lord, for this worship hour. Thank you, Lord, for this worship time. We're going to worship you, Heavenly Father, in your Son, Jesus' name. Amen. Thinking moments. Boy. I've got two. All right, we'll go brief. Before I do, though, again, uh, the leadership wanted to, to make an announcement that January 7th is Saturday. There's a follow-up to the first uh, financial seminar. It'll be at 9 o'clock right here, same person, uh, same time. Um, so mark your calendars for that. That being said, thinking moment. All right. Doesn't get any better than this. Front page of the L.A. Times, Monday morning, December 26. Here's the picture. Let me tell you what it said. Lighting the way to peace and goodwill. Christmas service done by a particular denomination for the Ukrainian soldiers. Sorry. This isn't Christmas. If you look at Mary's song in Luke chapter 1, which we did the sermon, you will not find these words there. The reason why you won't is because goodwill and peace, that's not the Christmas story. And this is a worldwide picture. Now you see why people have a misconception about this doctrine. And here we just got a great illustration worldwide. The second one is reinforced. The role of government is to protect us and serve us and make it peaceful for us. We had a big issue in L.A. City Council. Remember that? Racism flying all over the place. Well, well, we got another one. And now it's in San Mateo's, weak with no mayor. This mayor is half white and half Chinese. And now there's an issue there. And so let me just read it really quickly. It says, with political turmoil exploding from the L.A. City Council chambers, to the U.S. Capitol, the conflict in San Mateo became yet another manifestation of just how we can't get along. And then they went on to say, it's a power grab in defiance of good government. The same issues that happened at the L.A. City Council are happening here. Wow. You know what that shows? Man is by nature evil, wicked, and self-centered. And I don't care what city council you have them. In fact, I'm even going to make this step. Before we end in 2023, if I'm still living, the Ventura City Council will be used as an illustration. I'll guarantee it. Any city council. Because they got a fallen nature. And they're selfish, and they look for their own particular wants under the guise of serving people. 
And the only way it will ever work is if they all become Christians. And that's really not going to happen. So, again, illustrations for us that the Bible is true. Man is self-centered and selfish and wants his way. I don't care what he says for the press. Just for us to know. All right, this is a special day. I don't know if you were aware of this, but the Jewish um, community uses a different calendar. It's called the Lunai Solar Calendar. Um, they use it today. And today is their 10th month. January. Their 10th month is January. Our first month is January. Their first day for the 10th month is today. Our first day for our first month on the calendar we use is today. So before we pray, I want to read to you what happened in Genesis on their calendar. And then we're going to take those things as we go before our Lord. It comes from uh, Genesis 8, verse 5. I'll read it really quickly. What is the backdrop? Man, God flooded the whole world. And it was obviously a punishment issue. And then in verse 5, just one verse, something happens that he promised he would do. And that is this. Verse 5, the waters continue to recede until the 10th month on the first day of the 10th month. What happened? The tops of the mountains became visible. The tops of the mountains became visible. And what I think today, as we look at these mountain tops, if you will, in our life, they speak to us too. And you'll see it in our altar prayer. So let's go before the Lord. We're going to look at four more uh, names that describe his character and who he is. And this is our personal God. And then we'll look at these mountain tops through prayer. Let's pray. Father, again, we, we thank you for 2023. We have no idea what to happen. Some of us may be gone before it ends. The reassuring thing is that you know everything. You know. And us being a part of you because of our relationship, we can rest in that, have comfort in that. Psalm 79, 9 states, Help us, O God, our Savior, for the glory of your name. We want to look at that again. As we march through these 800 names of Christ, of you, we want to get another glimpse, like we did with the cross, of who you are, what your nature is, and how we can embrace that that we might have even a closer fellowship as a result with you. Psalm 51.3 calls you my rock and my fortress. Psalm 31.2 states, you are my rock of protection. Psalm 31, 2 again states, you are my rock of refuge. And Psalm 42, 9 calls you my rock solid God. Whoa, what names these describe? My rock, my fortress, my protection, my refuge, my rock solid God. That's who we go to. That describes you. We want to go back to the 10th month on the first day in Genesis 8, verse 5. 
and then ask you to apply certain prayer needs from these mountain top views. So first, Lord, we come before you and, and are looking at these reassuring mountain tops that you gave your people back then. And right now, you have given us your divine promises, mountain top experiences. Second Peter 1 4 calls them great and precious promises of God for us. And you pledge them to us. So now before we're here in front of you, we're not going to ask for specific things. We're going to ask for the beginning of 2023 that you give every believer these mountain top divine promises that Peter calls them great and precious for your divine presence in our life. Promises that tell us that for divine protection in our life. Promises that you've given to us to fulfill that. And divine promises for provision in our life. I pray that for every believer this morning. That 2023 would be an experience, a mountaintop experience, where we tap into the great and precious promises that you pledge to your children for your presence, for your protection, for your provision. We don't want to stop there. Those are the promises that are ours. And may we each experience them throughout the year and reflect on those moments that you give them to us. But we want to look at the mountaintop experience of spiritual possibilities for every believer today. John 1.12 says, The Lord gives power to become. So let us forget what might have been when we look at possibilities in our life and help us to claim the promise, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. A mountaintop experience of spiritual possibilities that John states, the Lord gives power to become. Help us to forget might have beens. And let us replace those thoughts with, I can do all things in 2023. Man, I pray that this would become reality for me and others this morning to carry us out through 365 days. Still not done. As we look to those mountaintop peaks, we are asking you to remind us of the Christian privileges, those mountaintop privileges that are only ours. 1 John 1, 3 says, that we have fellowship with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Could you do something for us, Father, this year as we commit to put you first? Would you give us, as a result of these mount available to Christians, would you give us more joy this year? Forget the circumstances. Leave them as they are. Give us the joy of the Lord in. Give us the peace of God while we walk through them. 
Give us the guidance that you would have for us to follow, given by the Holy Spirit, as we address them. And there's so much more. We just looked at three. Joy, peace, guidance. Christian privileges. Mountaintop privileges that are only ours. Boy, I pray that you bless us and shower us with those this year. And finally, the mountaintops of challenging opportunities. Boy, we're going to get them this year. They're coming. Every single Christian will have challenging opportunities that we will have to face. So for this year, as I pray for Olivet and Benaya and those watching online, help us to forget our failures of the past, except maybe to learn from them. But as the enemy keeps bringing them back, help us to forget them. And I pray for one thing. Help us to trust you more and ourself less. In 2023, may it be a year where we put you more at the forefront and depend and trust you more than ourselves making all the decisions. And when we finish it up next year, if it's your will that we're here, may we have testimony after testimony of our experience with these mountain peak promises that you give us. May you get the glory we be ready this year to do battle and may our walk increase in Jesus name we pray amen I'll turn it over to the ushers for our offering all right January depression one month right then joy of the Lord, month number two for February, right? We're going to go back and forth. Okay, I'm really excited about this, young people. Um, I mean, this is for everybody that are Christians and are battling with this issue. But young people, you're at a big disadvantage. And let me say why. Because most of the time when you go to your churches and do your thing is social groups. And you're not getting taught doctrine. If you don't know this basic doctrine that we're going to talk about today, you're going to be in trouble. You will be hammered. And to prove my point, before we even start, you tell me if you're battling with being discouraged all the time and you can't figure out a way out. If you answer yes to that, it's lack of knowing a basic biblical principle. So if you're a young person, you need to get this if you want to live a successful Christian life. And then I'll throw in everybody else. We're right behind you. All right? Even the old folks don't know the 10 basic doctrines. We tried it. Right? Even the preachers can get to three or four. So look at the state of Christianity. So, that being said, uh, we are going to take a look at a cause of depression for Christians. Romans chapter 3 verse 28 is our text. You do have an outline provided for you if you're online with Wes. Um, we will be covering everything in the outline except letter B at the end of the outline. We'll pick that one up um, in part 2 next Sunday. Romans chapter 3 verse 28. Now, remember I mentioned we got to know doctrine. There are 10 or 12 basic ones. Most Christians don't know them at all. You're going to get one today. So you can mark down your first one as we work through this passage. And it's critical. Uh, Romans 3, verse 28. 
and I'm reading from the NIV version. It says, For we maintain that a man or woman is justified by faith apart from observing the law. Let's pray. Father, again, as we come before you, we defer to the Holy Spirit and ask that he would teach us afresh. This is a topic that Christians hide. They don't want to admit to. And yet, we found a few weeks back, everybody, everybody has issues with this. And so we want you, Holy Spirit, to minister to us, to teach us, to show us in your word how we can find freedom and release from this area that keeps so many Christians living in the valleys of their Christian walk instead of the mountaintops. And we don't know what to do. So may you bring to the forefront this morning another couple of principles that we can apply to give us freedom in this area and show us and teach us the way that we can continue to keep that freedom. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, there can be no doubt about this that the condition known as spiritual depression is a very common complaint. It's not unique by a few Christians. A lot battle with it. Because we live in a world, and if you look at it, we live in a world that a lot of trouble, a lot of turmoil, a lot of difficulties, a lot of sadness. When you live in a condition like that, it's natural that you are going to battle with spiritual depression. As Christians, though, we should be handling this situation better than the world. Why do I say that? And this is all introduction right now. I say that because we have a different setting, if you will. We're a different race. We have a roommate. God indwells us. We have the promises, those mountain peaks that God has given us that we pray during altar prayer of. Promises of a living word that changes people. New race, new birth as a result of it, new roommate that never leaves us, and the promises of God's word. Yet, when we read in the Old Old Testament of other Christians, even, pay attention young people, even teenagers, they stand out to us despite their circumstances or conditions they seem to handle things way better than us. They seem to possess a secret that enables them to live triumphantly when they're facing these problems that they actually can say, you know what, like it says in Romans 8.37, I'm more than a conqueror. We can't. And that makes me think. That concerns me. I can't say that. I look at the teenagers, the three of them, getting ready to be thrown in the furnace, and it's amazing to me how they handle that. I can't. And I don't see it today. But it's the same God. He says he never changes. So why do they stand out like they got some secret and we don't? 
And so it concerns me and it behooves then you and I to examine this topic thoroughly and find out the secrets so that we can stand out, not just for ourselves, but to show the world. I have the answer for you. And they'll see it and they'll come to you because of it. So the state of spiritual depression is going to lead us to our theme. So I'm going to go slow. The true Christian position. If you don't know it can lead to depression. I give it to you again. You have it in your outline. The true Christian position. Not knowing it can lead to depression. So young people, if you don't know this doctrine right now, you're going to be prone to falling to this. That's the dilemma. So let's do a quick review because not last Sunday, but two Sundays before, we had our first look at spiritual depression. It came from Psalm 42 and we focused on verses 5 and 11. Remember that? Part 1, part 2. And we looked at the condition of spiritual depression in general, and we looked at some causes of it. We've already seen one of the most important things to handle it, and the essence of the treatment of spiritual depression in our lives is that we must face ourselves. Remember that? What do I mean by that? How do we face ourselves? He said, you got to talk to yourself. Remember that? Instead of allowing ourselves to talk to us. Now this is huge. You got to handle this guy in you. If you don't, he will handle you. What, what do you mean he? Who are you talking about? I'm talking about the self inside. That when you're quiet and not verbalizing and you're thinking, that guy, you got to handle him or he will handle you. Have you ever noticed when people are depressed? Ask them sometime. They just want to lay down. They don't want to talk to anybody. They're curled up. Ask them what they're thinking about. Because they don't have a blank mind. They're thinking while they're in that position. Ask them. That's the guy that you need to handle. And if they're in that condition and that, like I just described, guess who they're listening to? That guy. And Satan works in conjunction with him to keep them in that state. So we must take ourselves by the hand and we must address ourselves like the psalmist did. Remember in verse 5 and verse 11, he goes, hey, self. Yeah, really. In fact, let's turn there. I wasn't going to do it. Psalm 42. But now that that thought hit me, I know where it's coming from. So, just so you know that what I'm saying is not me. Look at the text. Look at verse 5 of Psalm 42. And he says, he's talking to himself, but look what part he's talking to. Why are you downcast? The Hebrew word there means depressed. Why are you depressed? Oh, my soul. Oh, the guy inside. Okay, that's who he's talking to. That's what we need to do. And look what he asks him. Why, soul, are you depressed? What is our soul? It's our mind. We're still not on the outline yet. Our mind, emotions, and will. It's the real us. It's inside the body. So what he's doing is talking to the soul. The part of us that's the thinker, yeah. The part of us that's the feeler, okay. The part of us that is the chooser, oh, the real me, yeah. That's who he's talking to, and he verbalizes it. It's a soul issue when you're talking about spiritual depression. It's not external, it's internal, and it deals with your mind, deals with your emotions, deals with your will, all of it. 
And guess who the creator of the soul is? Genesis 2, verse 7 says, God breathed into man and made him a living soul. Or your Bible say a living being. Oh, that's the soul. That's you. The body dies. The soul keeps living. And depression is resolved internally. You ready? As we learned in Psalm 42, by God. Remember what he said? I get to you and I look at you and guess what you do? You start changing the way I look. Yeah, because it's an inside out thing, not an outside in. It starts with the soul. So the question is, and he asks himself, why are you discouraged? Why are you depressed? That's the thing we need to do. And he faces himself when he does that. So I'm going to tell you the best way to remember it, still introduction, you need to pull a Robert De Niro. And I bet you that I know he's as far away from church today as any human being that's unsaved. He is not a believer. But there was a movie that he did called Taxi Driver. And in the movie... He talked to himself. He said, are you talking to me? Are you talking to me? You must be talking to me. There's nobody else around here. You remember the scene? That's what you got to do. That's exactly what you have got to do. Every time when you start to fall into these thoughts, you have got to pull a Robert De Niro. And you don't even have to start with scripture. Quote the movie lines. Hey, self, you talking to me? <laughs> you must be talking to me. I'm the only one here. Well, let me tell you something. That's what the psalmist did. And what, what specifically did he say? Well, he argued with them. Why are you depressed? Why? And then, not only did he argue, he brings himself back to a position to God because he says in those verses, hope in God. Self, what are you doing? You're pulling me this way. No. So you see he's exhorting, he's arguing, and he's pointing to self. You know what? The problem? Got to get back to God. That's what he's doing. Now, when you do that, then you can pray. But when you're depressed, try praying. See if it works. Now, it won't, you won't be able to do it. Why? Because you're down. You're discouraged. So you pull a Robin De Niro. And you start to argue and handle the guy inside. You argue with him. You exhort him. You point him in the right direction. Then you can start to pray and ask God to help you. Now, we're going to pick it up from here for today's sermon. All right? And what we're going to start to do is look at various causes that contribute to being spiritually depressed. We're going to take them one at a time, okay, for a month. And then in February, we're going to be in Philippians on how we can experience the joy of the Lord despite circumstances for a month. Then we'll flip back and look at more causes, okay? That's where we're headed. So we're going to pick it up now. So now here we go. Introductory comments. Now we're hitting the outline. So let's start. Number one, not knowing the true Christian position is due to not being clear in our minds about certain fundamental matters. Give it to you again. 
This is the start of the issue or the cause that we're going to be addressing. Not knowing the true Christian position. And we will discuss it, and I'll show you some people that fall into this problem. Is due to not being clear in our minds about certain fundamental matters. All right. So now the question that I posed Wednesday that I'm going to raise again today without asking at least Olivet to respond, but I can ask the online people to respond. How many people have been raised or brought up in the church? If you raise your hand, you are going to be more likely and prone to falling into spiritual depression for this particular cause. And we're going to show why from numerical number one that we just read. So under A, here we go. Those raised in a religious upbringing, those raised in a religious upbringing are more likely to fall into being unclear about primary Christian matters. Do you want it again or can we keep going? Keep going. All right. So now let me explain that. Let me explain that. What I'm saying, if you've been raised in the church, then you fall into a group that has always been going to a place of worship. Your parents took, took you when you were young. That wasn't me. But if you've been raised, this is what happens. You go and you hear all kinds of stuff. You've heard the preacher. And you've heard the testimonies. You've heard the songs. And now all of a sudden, because it's God's place, you've got the Christianese there. But you take it all for granted. And guess what you don't usually get? A detailed discussion of the doctrine. When that happens, you are left not clear about who you are as a believer. You got the general stuff. But I'll prove it as we work through here. So you go through life the way Shakespeare defined people in one of his books, which is bound in the shallows and in miseries, and we live life like that. And most Christians, I hate to say it, live like that in the valleys. They never seem to be able to get out. And they're in church. So what we want to do, and if that describes you, then today's going to be the day that you find freedom. If that describes you, don't be discouraged about it because there are a lot of Christians that fall into this. They're unhappy with their situation. So the, and here's what they say, why can't I beat this? I thought being, you sing the songs, you hear people get excited about having joy and peace, but, but you sit there quietly and say, not me, not me. And then all kinds of thoughts happen. Number two, so this is key to the very first step that we want to eliminate for this cause. Not being right about his or her, here's the word now, first doctrine. Not being right about his or her justification is the perfect way to get depressed. Why do I say that? That's the very first step in becoming a Christian. I give it to you again. Not being right about his or her justification is the perfect way to get depressed. Now, young people, shooting at you right now, give the definition of justification. If you got a struggle and you can't spit it out really quick right now, you're in trouble. You're in trouble because now I'm going to tell you the best example of what happened to this and how that will affect you. Let me give you a preacher who fell into this. He's a very famous guy. He was a missionary, a preacher, he, a writer. His name was John Wesley. 
John Wesley, I believe, was saved. But he battled because despite, and he, was, he grew up in the church, an incredible Christian home. But he didn't understand Romans 3, 28. And in light of not understanding it, he got depressed. He battled it. And this was and is the case with a large amount of Christians today. The fundamental basic doctrine, this one. Watch how Satan works it. Here's what happens, young people. You skip the first step and focus on the second doctrine. When you do that, you're in trouble. So the first doctrine, so we got one now. We're going to get all 12 as we work through this. The first doctrine, justification. Just as though I've never sinned. That's what it means. Okay? Here's what Satan does. De Satan has you forget that doctrine and the understanding of it and has you move to doctrine number two, sanctification. And what is sanctification? Living the life and being holy. So you hear people that say, well, I can't go to church until I get right. Well, you, homie, you can't get right until you have justification. You skip justification, you're going to talk like that. I can't go to church until I get right. Let me get right, then I'll go. Well, why do you talk like that? You can never get right. You talk that way because nobody taught you about just as though you've never sinned. That's the problem. If you understood that, you wouldn't say, I got to get right. You would understand. And so you have all these people coming to church, trying to live right, and Satan pounds it. It's a hustle job. And they miss the very first step. You cannot become a Christian until you have justification. Then you move to the next step on living the lifestyle. Does that make sense? You, you know, it's like telling a baby, you're going to run the 100 meter. Oh, I understand you can't, you can't walk yet. You crawl. You're gonna, let's get you in training because we're going to have a 100-meter dash. He can't walk. You know, get him walking and, and a while, then you can talk about that. That's what Satan does. He skips the initial doctrinal teaching of salvation and gets you focused on the lifestyle of a Christian. And nobody can do that. So, in fact, when you look at Satan, he comes at you three ways. I'll give them to you. This is not in your notes. But let me give them to you because he's irritating me because I'm, I'm getting bombarded with these thoughts right now. The first thing he does in 1 Peter 5, 8, he comes to you with like a roaring lion, right? A roaring lion is intimidation, that's how he comes to you. In what way? In the thoughts. So if you're getting depressed, he's going to bounce that one. He's going to hammer it on you and say, well, how can you even be saved? Look at you. You'll never get out of this. You're stuck. This is you. That's by not handling the guy inside of you. You're going to listen to him. Okay. And the other way, uh, uh, he comes to you as an angel of light. He's going to say, you want to be a good Christian, focus on sanctification, live a holy life, be holy. God is holy. You should be holy, but you're not. See, and that comes from 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, an angel of light. That means he comes like the truth. He gives you the thought that seems right. And it says, even the elect Christians get hustled by that. And, he, and then the, you wrap it all up into a neat package, and he's the accuser. Every time you get accused in your mind, you, know, you should know where it's coming from. So all of these things he's going to address you on in terms of living a lifestyle. In the meantime, he's going to make sure you forget about justification. And that's what we're going to camp on. So small a, let me give you an example of a group of people 
that are doing exactly what we're talking about right now, and they're religious. You ready? Here we go, under A. The Jews had this problem in the Old Testament with the law. The Jews had this problem in the Old Testament with the law. Now, let me explain this. Jesus checked them on it. That's why they didn't like them. He's saying the law can't save you. It won't save you. They wanted to debate him. They hated him because of that. And then guess who else they went after? Because we're reading in Romans, and you're going to see it later, Rome, the Roman uh, uh, letters are written by Paul, a Jew. And he's saying the identical thing to the Jews that Jesus said, and he's going to get checked, and they're going to come after him. They didn't like him. And here it is. The Jews were entirely wrong with the whole question of the law. It became an interpretation issue, and they missed it. Today, understanding justification, ready, is an interpretation issue. Young people, if you can't spell it out and give it to me simply and quick, then you have an interpretation issue. And that's the very first step in understanding your salvation. So consequently, if you don't have the first step and understand it, good luck with the rest. Now you're prone to be spiritually depressed, and we'll see how that happens. The main problem with the Jews was to show them the right view. Here's what the Jews believed on the law. They believed that the law was made by God in order that man might save himself by keeping it. That was their interpretation. God gave us, the Jew, the law, and we can save ourselves if we can live by it. What they did is watered it down so they could live by it. And that's what they got checked on. They thought God would accept them. What did Jesus say? No, 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 no. You're a sinner. And if you're a sinner, you need a savior. You cannot save yourself. They argued with him on that. That's the picture of the Pharisees in the Gospels. You read any of the Gospels, these preachers felt that they could save themselves by applying the law. And what they were getting hammered with by Christ and Paul and the other apostles is you can't. And today, the same picture happens to Christians. The essence of the problem of spiritual depression, one of the causes, is not understanding the doctrine, just as though I've never sinned. That has to be perfectly clear. I want you to understand, if you've accepted Christ in your heart for the forgiveness of sins, you are perfect in God's sight, spiritually. You are perfect. You need to get that in your head. We'll get to sanctification another day. But right now, positionally, you are perfect. Let's look at the definition here under one. Justification, let's understand it, is the righteousness of God. Justification is the righteousness of God given by God to man at the point of salvation. At the point of salvation. So let me explain it now. So what happens when you accept Christ at that very day, whatever day, if you can remember when that was, that moment, what God did for you was give you his righteousness to you when you accepted Christ that very day. 
you were as if you've never ever sinned in your life. That's the idea of justification. The righteousness of God really means this, the rightness of God, the holiness of God. The righteousness of God means the holiness of God. So the moment you accepted Christ, guess what? Spiritually, you are right with God. Who can God have in his presence? Only the holy. That should be a song. Only the holy. He cannot have anybody else in his presence that is sinful. That's why Christ came. We learned that. So justification just as though you've never sinned, is God giving you at the point of asking him in your heart for the forgiveness of sin, his holiness. He gave it to you. And if you want to do something this week to learn more about it, now that you have the definition, read the first four chapters of Romans. Paul is arguing And showing that the very first step that must be understood is justification. Romans chapter 1, 2, 3, and 4. You see that and you understand what he's saying. That's the theme of the first four chapters. He spends four chapters talking about the very first doctrine that is necessary for you and I to get a handle on what happened to us. If you miss it, then you'll be prone. Because here's what happens. You're raised in the church and and you've heard it. You've heard everything, but maybe not the details. And then as you get older, look what happens. A lot of the young people leave. Why? Because they're having some issues. And the same things keep popping up. And it's because they don't understand the doctrine. I'm not saying they're not saved. I'm saying they may have gotten saved, but now they're floundering. And now they see that it's useless. Work can get... And now they have to try to... And then they go, you know what? It doesn't work. And they get discouraged. And every time they come back to church, what does Satan do? Have them skip justification, go to living holy. They can't do it. And they go, you know what? Just like before, I'm out. See? So look at small a, Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. And I want you key on the fact that we just described justification. Listen to what Paul says. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God. Okay, now it's the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For in the gospel... Look at this. A righteousness from God is revealed. A, he says it again. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous or the holy or those right with God will live by faith. Now, this is a slam to the Jews. The Jews got it. The Gentiles are sinners. They didn't look at themselves as sinners. That's what hit them. And look what Paul said. This is for everyone who believes. First for the Jew. What's he saying to the Jew? You're a sinner too, dog. You're like them. You all are the same. And they nodded up. Because they said, we got the law. We're living to the law. We save ourselves. No, 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 no. That's why Jesus bumped off. He said, you want to talk law? Let's talk law. It's the spirit here. So you want to look at a woman and say, you don't do that? Well, if you thought it, you did, homie. Now that makes you a sinner. That's what they didn't like. See, they played with the law. They watered it down. Now Paul comes back and said, you know what? Everybody's in this camp. Everybody needs what? Justification by faith. Everybody to be saved. And they didn't believe it. Here's why. Watch this. They didn't believe it 
because they didn't have a need for it. They said, we can save ourselves by living with the law and applying it. That was their problem. And so today we live in a culture, and think about this, we live in a culture we can't even get Christmas right. We think it's good cheer and goodwill. You don't even have it right. And this is out there, let alone, let's get to the doctrinal stuff now. We can't even get the basic birthright in our culture. And so that's because we have a wrong view of righteousness. A wrong view. And again, righteousness means being right with God. Being right with God means being holy. And we just read it. This should, you should remember uh, chapter 1 of Romans 16 and 17. That righteousness God gives you. We'll look at that next Sunday, how he does it. He gives it to you so that you are as if you've never sinned. Final. That's the fact. That's the fact. So what is this teaching of being right with God? Now we get to Roman number one. You ready? Here we go. We must be absolutely clear about our sinfulness. Well, preacher, letter A. How do we do that? How do we do that? Under one, A1, you must have a true conviction of sin. What do you mean by that? In order to have a true conviction of sin, you got to know what sin is. Right? That makes sense. If I know what it is, define it for me. If I can do that for you, then you know what it is. Then you can have a true conviction. But when you're growing up in the church, you hear it all the time. And I bet you that nobody can give a definition in, in churches like that when it's not taught. So you have the poor young person saying, well, a, a sinner. Are you a sinner? Yeah, I'm a sinner. What is a sinner? I don't know. See? So yeah, someone who sins. What does that mean? You, you, you know? So we got to know it. When you know it, now you can get convicted about it. Look at Luke 2, verse 34, under A. You do have that? Uh, uh, okay. Luke 2, Luke 2, verse uh, 34. 2, 34, here it is. NIV version again. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined He's talking, talking about Christ. This is the whole birth of Christ. This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against. Now, what is he saying? And here's what we need to see. There's no rising again until there has been a preliminary fall in a person's life. That's what they're talking about. That's what he's saying, that Christ is going to cause a falling and a rising to many in Israel. In other words, you can't rise unless you fall first. That's the rule in, in the Bible, in Christianity. What does that mean? When you talk salvation, you got to have hit the bottom. You got to know the fall and what that means. Then you can rise. You can't just walk in and rise without knowing the fall. Man has fallen. You've heard me say it over and over and over. He has a nature that he or, or she is prone to sin. That is us. That's why I love picking city council articles. Because they're all fallen creatures. And when you're fallen, you're selfish. And when you're selfish, you want your way, not God's way. And that's the point in this text when he made that comment. And a Christian is one who recognizes his or her sin and gets convicted. Ergo, the fall. Now they can rise. Now they can see. See? And that's what the reference is to. So number two, numerical two, you must know what sin is. You must know what sin is, comma, 
Now we're going to define it. Sin defined. I want to go slow here, okay? Sin defined. Under A, here we go. Sin should never be thought of only, that's the first blank, sin should never be thought of only in terms of action. That's the first part of it. So when you think of sin, you should never think of it only in terms of action. It should be thought also of in terms, the next two blanks, in ter it, should, it should not only be thought of in terms of sins that you name. Okay? Does that make sense? Am I explaining it okay? In other words, sin should never be thought of just a list of things that we name. Oh, yeah, murder. Okay, you're a sinner. And I'll explain why that, if we do that, Here's the problem that we'll miss. And then the third part of it is, or should never be thought of particular actions only. Particular actions only. So I'll give you the whole definition again if you're taking notes online. Here it is. Sin should never be thought of only in terms of action, comma, or in terms of sins that are named, comma, or particular actions only. Here's why. If you don't do the action, then you look at yourself and say, I'm not a sinner. See? So when you hear preachers that'll say, well, if you don't do this and this and this and this, you're, no, you're not. See, you can put somebody in a position where they're saying, well, I don't commit adultery. I don't commit murder. I, you know, I'm a good person then. No. You may be a good person, but you're still a sinner. See? And Scripture has its order, and the order must be observed if you want the benefits of having salvation. So we're going to keep moving now. The only thing that will, here we go, the only thing that will drive a person to Christ is understanding sin, having a true conviction. That will drive them to Christ. And those brought up in religious settings or in a Christian manner, this is their chief problem right here. This is the problem. So if you've been raised in the church, the chief problem is the wrong idea of sin. Ask them to define sin for you. Ask a young person to def And if they start backpedaling, whoa. <laughs> Now the whole can of worms gets opened up. Well, if you don't know what sin is, then how do you have a true conviction? Without a true conviction, how do you know it's real for you? And it doesn't lead, if you don't have a right definition of sin, it won't lead to real conviction. And I'm going to prove it in a second. So, so how can these people be convicted of sin? That's a fair question. How can those that maybe have never been shared that from the pulpit, uh, especially young people, how do we work with that? And you should have a small number one. Let me give you the text. We're almost done for part one. Romans 3, 22 and 23. Romans chapter 3, 22 and 23. And here's what it, Romans 3, 22 and 23. Here's what it says. The righteousness, there's our word again. There we go. Righteousness, holiness of God, rightness with God. This righteousness from God, yep, comes through faith. Okay, no works. You don't apply doing the law in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's right, Paul. That's exactly it. So who's the all in this, in this text? Paul's telling the Jews and the Gentiles, y'all are sinners. Everybody's a sinner. That's the DNA of man. Okay? Number three, how do we then handle this? And then we'll be done. The way to know, the way to know, 
yourself as a sinner is to come face to face with the law of God. I give it to you again. The way to know yourself as a sinner is to come face to face with the law of God. In other words, we need to see God's standard. We need to come face to face. Now do you see why doctrine is so important? You've got to bring the young person or the old person face to face with the law of God. You mean like the Old Testament? The law hasn't changed. That's right. That's standard. You can go with the Big Ten, but here's the problem. Remember we said you pick a name of sin, and if the person hasn't done the sin, they think they're cool. So go ahead and pick coveting. Oh, I haven't. I don't want people's stuff. So that makes me holy. Okay. No. This just happened to me uh, several months ago where this person goes, well, what's the law of God? I said the Big Ten. They had me, see? Because they, then they started going through, well, I don't do this. I don't do that. I don't do that. I'm good. I told you I'm a good person. Then you know what I said? Thank God for this. I said, you know, there are more than just 10 laws of God. What we're doing and what you're doing is taking part of the law, not the law in its entirety. So let me give it to you, and then you respond to me. They said, oh, how are you going to do that? We'll be here forever. No, we won't. I'll give you, in one statement, the whole law of God. It's in your outline. Mark chapter 12, 30 through 31. Mark chapter 12, and then we're going to shut it down. Mark 12, 30 through 31. Watch this one now. This, this, Jesus had the same question posed playing head games, and then they wanted to know, which is the greatest law? And he said, man, I'm going to show you do these two, and you covered it all, all of the law of God. And what's the point here? The way to know that you're a sinner is bring them face to face with the law of God. So here we go, verses 30 and 31. And here's what it says. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Penny drops. So I said, can you tell me that every day of your life you've loved the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, that you've always remembered him, you always put him first, you always prayed, you talk to him throughout the day, or did you ever forget about him one day? Did you ever get out of bed, forget the whole day, maybe a week? They looked at me and I went, sinner. Yeah, that's what did it. Now they know that they're a sinner. Now in light of that, you can have true conviction. And with that, if you're battling with depression, I'm going to close it, but I'm going to give you two scriptures. They're not in your outline. I just, the Lord put them on my heart to share with you um, for a week until we do the part two, where we get into handling this. But the two scriptures are Proverbs 13, 19, and it states this, a longing fulfilled is sweet to the soul. So if you have a longing to get out of this cloud of depression. Getting out is sweet to the inner part of who you really are, the mind, emotions, and will. We will give you that next Sunday. And the other scripture is Psalm 94, 19. It says, when, I had a, when anxiety built up in my heart, which leads to being discouraged, worry and discouraged, your consolation brought joy to my soul. So what we're going to give you next Sunday in part two is God's consolation. We're going to give you God's truth 
so that it will minister to your soul and you will find freedom. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, thank you. We got the number one doctrine. The number one doctrine. It starts with just as though we've never sinned. Because we're sinners. We've broken the law of God. We've lived life not loving you with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength. Man, that alone right there is enough to show every human being we've forgotten you. And that's missing the mark. Your standard is that we don't. But we do. So because of that, we're fallen. We're self-centered. We need a Savior. How ironic that we're celebrating the very first Sunday of 2023 in his communion. And this message is right on the heels of it. And so, for those that are battling being discouraged, spiritual depression, we want to lift them up. And I pray that your truth will minister to them. That if they can see, once you have been accepted, and if they've asked you into their heart, then right at that very moment, eternal life started for them. And you don't look at them as somebody trying to get right. You look at them as already right, just as though they've never sinned. Right with God, perfect with you, holy as you are holy, because of the righteousness of our Savior, Christ, who they accepted. May you embed those truths, those facts of their hearts today. May they meditate this whole week on that. This is part one. So that next Sunday when we get to part two, they're going to see the freedom. But it starts with a true conviction. May you comfort them with this truth. They're perfect right now. Forget living it right now. We get to that another day. That's a different doctrine. Your word requires order. We can't skip to the second or third or fourth or tenth step without first going to the first step. And that's justification that Jesus gives us at the cross. What a Savior. So as we pray for those that are battling with this, may and Holy Spirit minister to them this week. Continue to let them know that they're perfect. Positionally, spiritually, they're perfect. You see them that way. And we can work on the experiential side later. But right now, step one, they're in. They're perfect. You look at them as perfect. Help them handle the guy inside this week help them talk help them argue help them exhort that self that wants to deny the truth help them pull a Robert De Niro That every time this happens, every time the thoughts come, every time the accuser gives them these particular thoughts that cause them to be discouraged, Holy Spirit, give them some fun. Let him know it's Robert De Niro time. And let them copy the psalmist in Psalm 42 and talk to the guy that's in them. And if they have to get in a knockdown, drag out argument, if one comes back with a thought, give them the courage to talk back. I know that they can do it. They do it with humans. So they can do it 
with themselves. Give them the courage this week. Let them taste and see your truth works. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Part two next Sunday. Same cause. Part two, a little more information to give us freedom in the very first cause of spiritual depression. At this time, we're going to move into our um, communion service. Um, and so we'll ask you to uh, please take your covenant if you have before you. And I'll ask you to follow with me as we read the covenant. Will you stand, please? Thank you. What common experience leads us into spiritual fellowship and covenant relations with God and one another? By what pledge do we turn from the ways of the world? We promise by the aid of the Holy Spirit to forsake the paths of sin and to walk in the ways of holiness all the days of our lives. What are some of the privileges and duties in this our own church? With this meeting, we engage to strive for the advancement of this church in knowledge, holiness, and comfort, to promote its prosperity and spirituality, to sustain its worship. What vows do we gladly make as stewards of that which God has entrusted to us? For the sake of our home and loved ones, what task do we humbly assume? For the sake of the unsaved, for whom Christ died, to what manner of life and conversation are we solemnly pledged? To a lot of circumstances in the world, to be just in our giving, faithful in our patience, and assembly in our partner, to avoid all time, backbiting, necessitating, to abstain from the sale of the use of Luciana, or my mind, to the cross of any God, and to toss it in the prayer. Since one is our master, even Christ, and all we are brethren, by what fraternal ministries are we to strengthen each other and adorn the teachings of our Lord and Savior? For the good of our own spiritual development and for the best interests of the Master's kingdom, what do we promise to do if we move beyond the reach of this church? To keep of these our holy vows for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. All right, now we get to celebrate just as though we've never sinned the doctrine we talked about. So at this time, uh, and those of you online, you're sitting at home, you can 
join with us uh, for communion. We want to take some spiritual inventory. And that, what we're talking about, is just having the Holy Spirit run through the last several days, maybe the last week, um, and bring to the forefront maybe some things that we overlooked. It could be thought or deed or both. And whatever he brings to your mind, we'll ask you to uh, show the Lord respect and confess it. That's why he came to die, so that we would do this. If you decide not to do it, maybe you're battling and arguing with God, then we're going to tell you, just don't take communion then. Okay, show the Lord respect, pass on it. Don't worry, nobody's going to say anything, nobody's looking at you. We have enough to handle with our own life. So, uh, but we would encourage you, it's not hard. Go before him and confess. It's just you and him. And he'll, in 1 John 1, 9 says, if he will cleanse you from all unrighteousness if we confess our sins. He's faithful and just to do that. So let's take a few moments, let him have his way, confess what we need to, and then we'll bless the elements and have a communion. Father, thank you that we can come before you. We don't really even have to be in a church. Anywhere we're at, we can confess sin. And 1 John 1, 9, a promise. In fact, a mountain top promise, a privilege that whenever we come before you and say, Father, I've sinned this particular way, please forgive me for it and cleanse me from it. You promise in your word to do it. And you can't lie. You're holy. What a privilege to have that. Because with the forgiveness of sin comes the removal of the guilt of sin. Not only the action, whether it be thought or deed, but the guilt that comes with it gets wiped away. And if others have confessed sin and still have the guilt, it's false guilt by the enemy. So if they've confessed sin today, right now, and they still feel guilty, they got to point back to 1 John 1, 9. Because it's not real guilt. And Satan loves to play with our emotions and our thoughts. So if that's you today that you confess and it still seems like it's there, you need to talk to the dude that's in you and point him to 1 John 1, 9 and say, this is what God promised. This is what he's done. So, are you talking to me? <laughs> you got to be talking to someone else, dog. Can't be to me because I've got this promise. That's what you need to do. Father, we thank you for this privilege. What a mountaintop experience we get. Man, now we come before you to do something you've asked us to do in remembrance of you. And guess what? It's the doctrine of justification. Coming to make us right with God, holy with you, just as though we've never, ever, ever, ever sinned. Perfect. Thank you. And to get a lesson taught on it this morning by the Holy Spirit. Perfect for us. Thank you for letting us have this experience. The Bible says, white is the gate to destruction. And a lot and most go through it. Narrow is the great gate to eternal life. Few go through it. Well, guess what? Just as though we've never sinned, the just as though we've never sinners, 
we get to go through. Thank you. We ask you now to bless these elements. Bless the bread. Bless the cup. Let's reflect as we're taking it in this whole process that what you went through to get it done, even to just take a darn body that you didn't have, but did for us. And the pain and the suffering, not just physically, emotionally, spiritually, the weight of the world, humanity, because you loved us. How about that? Thank you for that. And as you bless these cups, may it, be, may it bring joy to our heart to be part of this family, your family. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know what I'm thinking right now, since it's so solemn, I'm waiting for the time when there's a problem with these things and none of us can open them at all, all at one time. I don't know what we're going to do at that time. Anyway, I'm just thinking out loud. It's almost happened to me a couple of times. All right, let's think of the time. Let's take it back when Jesus said to do this in remembrance of him. He was about ready to give the ultimate sacrifice himself, the body that he had for us. Even to today, we fast forward it to 2023, and I'm thinking, he said, you know, when he took the bread, he said it would be symbolic, that this bread would be representative of his body, that that body would have to take the punishment and penalty of sin, which is physical death, and spiritual death. And he said, I'm doing it because I love you. So when you eat this bread, think of me and the love I've had for you. So let's take the bread. And then he took the cup of wine and as he passed it, he said, do this in remembrance of me, that the wine would be representative of the shedding of blood. In the Old Testament, it states, no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. And the sacrifice has got to be perfect. So if you need a perfect sacrifice for humans, it's got to be a human who has no sin and who lived like we live. The perfect sacrifice, and that's our Savior. So he said, when you drink it, think of the blood that I shed for you so that you might have a reconnect with me. Let's partake of the cup. So from now on, wherever you're at, any communion you do, you need to remember you just celebrated the doctrine of just as though you've never sinned, justification. And that's the primary basic one. Now I'm going to ask you to do one thing, probably get in trouble for it, but it's okay, it's me. you got to handle the guy inside of you this week. You have got to do it. So that means that you're going to have, if you're not used to talking to yourself, then you got to practice. So I'm not going to let you leave until we do the Robert De Niro. All right? So you have got to say, you talking to me? All right, let's see, we do it one more time, a little more forceful. You talking to me? There we go. All right, that's it. That's what you got to do when those thoughts come. You do it, you're going to handle this guy, and you're going to win. You don't do it, we'll be right back where we were. Okay? Let's stand and I'll pray and we're out. Father, again, thank you for your word. It's living. It changes behavior. That's the whole point. It makes us more like you. We have the Holy Spirit in us that helps us, counsels us, illuminates truth. He did it for us today. We thank you for that. 
Again, a special prayer for those that have that cloud over them that they battle with and may not want to share it. Give them the courage to do the Robert Nero, to talk to themselves, to be aggressive in it, and minister to their hearts with what we've learned today. Reunite us next week. We can learn part two so we can find freedom in the first cause that gives us spiritual depression. Now to him who was able to keep us from falling, may there be grace, honor, and power henceforth and forevermore. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week fighting.